everybody who is here today. My name is Denise Moody. I am the director of Resilience Impact and I'm excited to have you all here today for this really important conversation. This is one of a series that we are doing every month for a free training on topics that are of interest to the um, people that I get to serve, which really focus on trauma-informed practices, mental health in schools, and social emotional learning and educator resilience. I'm excited to have this conversation today um, around creating a team around student mental health. I also work in a district and one of my roles is central office leadership around mental health services for the last 10 years. Um, and I know that many of the systems that we've created in our district have become overwhelmed in this post distance learning and unfortunately current distance learning, I think for many districts as we face the surge again in this new variant. And so really thinking about how can we augment, how do we need to shift our uh, mental health delivery services? How do we need to think different about mental health when so many people are struggling with that? So with that, I am going to go ahead and just invite our panelists to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what brought them to these positions and what their role is in the district. And so we are going to start off with um, Julia Bantimba and let her um, introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Denise. Um, I'm so happy to be here. This is such a timely and um, really important conversation. So I'm really grateful for the time. Um, I am Julia Bentimba. I'm an occupational therapist, um, and I've only really ever worked in mental health. I came into um, my position now. So right now, the title of my position is the Trauma Informed and Healing Centered Practices Specialist. Um, and I work for a group of non public schools. So our schools are all um, special education schools run by a nonprofit like private agency. Um, so all of our students come to us with um, an IEP, they all have some form of emotional behavioral diagnosis. Um, and I was originally hired at my agency about five years ago because our agency uses restraint and seclusion when necessary. And there was a big push kind of internally as well as from um, the state level to like basically stop using restraint with students with disabilities, which I think is um, great. Um, and so they were just looking for different perspectives on how to reduce the use of restraint and seclusion. And so they wanted someone with kind of more of a body based perspective. Um, and so I came in and um, started doing that and then kind of took a two year break in the middle to oversee our therapeutic preschool program. And now I'm back to that kind of original role. Um, and so it's been pretty exciting. It's kind of an odd job. I've never heard of anyone else doing it. So I'm kind of like, you know, making the plane as I fly it, but um, pretty cool. And I will pass to our next person. Thanks, Julia. My name is Kate Earle, and I'm the school social worker at Pine Island Schools. For those that aren't familiar, Pine Island is a small city in Minnesota near Rochester with about 3000 people. I joined this team just this past fall in 2021. So this is my first year with the district. Uh, my experience, I obtained my bachelor's degree in psychology from the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University, which is in St. Joseph, Minnesota, and then went on to earn my master's degree in social work with a specialty in clinical mental health from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I currently hold an LICSW licensure and as, as an independent clinical social worker, which allows me to provide therapy. Prior to this position, I worked at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, in the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology, and then as well as primary care for about seven years as a clinical social worker and psychotherapist. I co-developed an intensive outpatient program called the Pediatric Transitions Program, which was geared towards middle schoolers and high schoolers struggling with severe mental illness, primarily depression, anxiety, behavior problems, and then also those with suicidal ideation or attempts. In the primary care setting, I did individual couples and family therapy with pediatric and adult patients. And in my previous work, I've also collaborated closely with the schools and so admire and appreciate all that the school side can do for children and families. And I'm so happy to join the side of the process. And so in my current position, I'm the district school social worker. So I serve all students preschool through grade 12 as, as well as their families and also am a resource to staff. 
I was lucky enough to join an awesome mental health team that Pine Island Schools was already working with, including school counselors at the elementary, middle school, and high school levels, as well as two school-linked mental health therapists that we contract with through Zebra Valley Mental, or, sorry, Zebra Valley Health Center in Rochester. So as a clinical social worker and licensed therapist in my role, I'm available to help students that are struggling with any mental health challenge or symptom. Uh, that, that's just simply someone they can come talk to to get support and to teach them ways to manage their symptoms, give them coping skills and whatnot. I've started several group options through the schools. So in the elementary school setting, uh, we're doing a friendship group. At the middle school level, I've been co-leading some social emotional learning classes. Uh, so far, we've been focusing on kindness, empathy, bullying prevention, stress, anxiety, also working on small groups for eighth grade girls and coming up soon will be a seventh, eighth grade boys group. And at the high school level, I've led a six week stress management series and coming up in a week or two, I'll be leading one focused on anxiety for the high school level. And then lastly, I serve on several of the district's committees, including our PBIS committees, mental health wellness committees, and then our diversity, equity and inclusion committee. And then I also have provided professional development as well, um, such as trauma-informed schools training that I led just this past November. And then I'll pass over to my colleague, Tom Horner. Hey, thanks, Kate, and good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Horner. I work in the Pine Island School District as well with Kate. Um, and this year, I'm building a brand new role as the mental health and wellness coordinator. I live in Rochester with my wife, my son, my little golden doodle pup, some things I love doing. I, I love being active. I, I gravel bike, I lift weights, running, doing yoga. I enjoy competing in triathlons over the summer. Um, I'm very familiar with the schools. I taught health and PE for eight years in Lake City, Minnesota. And I quickly realized as a teacher, one of my biggest fears is you know, becoming a teacher and feeling the need to just know it all. And I quickly realized after a few years teaching that it, it's really not about how much you know. And it really reminded me that just building those relationships and trust with your students at the end of the day is all you really need to do as a teacher before you can do anything else. Um, so really throughout my experiences teaching, I, I understood this importance and just connected so well with kids who needed me most. Uh, and this is really my passion. I also found a passion for supporting um, students and staff beyond the classroom, offering things like yoga classes for students, staff, community members, strength training classes, individualized coaching in the weight room, and really develop these relationships with staff and students into being you know, somebody they could trust around at the school and somebody that's easily accessible. So uh, during my time teaching in Lake City, I earned my master's degree in teaching and learning. And then I just most recently finished my principal's license, and those are all through uh, St. Mary's University. So building this brand new role this year has been a perfect challenge for me this year, um, and it's evolving. Some of the things that I do, uh, a little bit all over the place, but my role as a mental health and wellness coordinator includes supporting the well-being broken up between students, staff, and families district-wide. I'm usually at all three buildings throughout the week. My role is really widespread, anything from embedding social emotional learning um, to speaking at PBIS assemblies, being an event coordinator for the Freaky 5K and community fun run wellness events, um, connecting with our local ship coordinators and Olmstead County Bridge Collaborate, um, even connecting with Denise and, and, and meeting new people around the community that provide some really valuable resources to you know, bring into our school. It's just been awesome. Uh, a big part of my role as well has just been kind of supporting professional development with staff. At the beginning of the school year, we, we planned something different. And for example, it was a, a PD event out of the ordinary focused 100% on connections with staff and wellness. Uh, we rented out a barn venue. We had lunch together along with staff had the choice to choose which breakout sessions they wanted to attend. So for example, Kate did an awesome job leading a session on mood and food. Um, I led one on brain breaks. We had our school linked well, uh, school linked mental health therapist doing gratitude practices, um, somebody else doing mental toughness, and even had a chance for staff to participate in yoga um, and, and yard games. So it was a it was a fun little thing. Uh, we also rolled out a new mindfulness tool just recently at the elementary um, called the Calm Classroom, which includes simple mindfulness breaks for uh, students throughout the day. Um, and then I'm very highly involved with committees throughout the school, so. 
Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I'm so sorry on my tech issues here. Um, if you have questions about anything that our panelists are saying as we go through this, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I want this to be as much conversational as possible, and I want it to be meaningful for all of you that are here. So um, I was hoping we could just circle back to Julia and talk a little bit more about some of the ways that you're supporting staff as well, and some of the things that you've been doing in your position. Oops. Yeah, um, so my position is um, has kind of evolved over the years. Um, right now, I'm mostly remote, partly because of COVID, and also I moved out of the area. But when I was closer to um, closer to my schools, um, I was I kind of had three main branches of things that I work on. And so one is like training and professional development for staff. So I've done a lot of training in brain development and the impact of trauma on how on the developing brain um, and the impact of trauma on on student behavior like through the through childhood um also on sensory strategies for the classroom and for the school um and then lately the past few years i've been doing a lot of reflective practice so working with supervisors and leaders like school leaders on um, supervision practices um another p part of my role is like direct consultation with staff about students so i spend a lot of my time talking with staff about how students are doing um and that's taken a few different forms at first it started out as like pretty formal like I would be told when a team was meeting about a student and then I would go to that meeting. Um, I've kind of pushed and tried to shape the role to be a little bit more informal so that whenever staff have a question or a need, they can just come to me because I think what I found and what we sort of know about adult learning is that um, people need the answers when they need them and when it's at a prescribed time when they have 100 other things to do, um, they learn less and so um, my my ideal situation is like kind of what I have going now, which is staff reaching out like, I just heard this thing happen to the student at home and I'm not sure like what I should do about it. Um, can you help out with that? Or, um, you know, I'm really struggling with this one kid. They're bringing up a lot of my own, like I knew someone in my past like this and, and it's making me anxious in the classroom. Like, how do I handle that? And so I do a lot of work with staff around things like that. Um, and then the other piece is consulting about our policies and procedures and like written documentation. Um, because my main focus is um, be making our system more trauma responsive. I'm not sure what, I don't really like any of the buzzwords, but I think that's like the current buzzword. Um, and so like making sure that our um, staff aren't being asked to do documentation that's not necessary, um, that we're not having meetings that aren't necessary because they're stressful and they take up people's time, um, making sure like a lot of stuff has been coming up around COVID, like people being worried about you know safety in schools and thinking with administrators like how do we talk to our teams in big meetings in a way that's not dismissive or causing more anxiety for people but instead is actually you know resilience building and um and and connection building like i want people to leave meetings feeling better connected to their administrators and to their teams than than they got there and so my role has kind of spread sort of wide but my main the thing that I like the most is talking to people about kids, like how are kids doing? What are kids, what are kids need? And how do we um, put in place like sensory body based brain aligned interventions um, to help them learn? Um, the other piece is that my schools are all therapeutic schools. So all of our students get weekly individual psychotherapy and group psychotherapy, and then they're all offered family therapy as well. So um, I do a lot of work kind of straddling both of the realms, like working with the psychotherapy teams as well as with the education and behavior teams. Um, yeah, I think that's most of it. So I think, um just kind of coming from a school perspective, the idea of being able to influence and have um, feedback to maybe um, central office teams or the administrators that are talking about these COVID safety precautions is maybe something that's appealing to a lot of people because sometimes the way that messaging happens is very triggering and um, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I think at times can feel like it's dismissive of people's very real concerns. Um, but I think that often people don't necessarily feel that, that there's a voice at the table. I mean, if we just really see what's unfolded in Chicago over the last week, um, that is an extreme case. But I, I think there's more of that that's happening everywhere. Um, so I, I just maybe 
I know I'm going a little off script of here, but like, how, how did you get a seat at that table? What kind of led your um, leaders to say like, this is a need that we want to invite you in to think about how to do this better? Uh, is that for me? Yeah, that's for you. Yeah, but no, that's something similar. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know the full answer to that question. So I um, worked at a different agency and had been doing some consulting to my current agency um, about some specific students like privately. And then um, I think there was a meeting where people were like, we need to do something about restraints and seclusions. Like our interventions aren't working. We're not seeing a decrease the way we want to. Like what perspective are we missing? Um, and so someone reached out and was like, hey, are you like open to changing jobs do you want a new job and it just happened to be good timing for me so i came in and um it was not there wasn't a well-formed idea about what the position would be it's definitely been like a co-creation between like lots of different people at the agency and myself um but it's turned into like when i got there and sort of did my assessment of like this is a mental health we so we serve kids who I think like 98% of our kids have experienced profound and ongoing early childhood trauma. Um, I was like, I think we need a, a staff body who understands what that means and can respond to that in a high level way. Um, and so I started out as like the OT consultant and then pretty quickly became the trauma informed services consultant because um, it was just apparent that like the kids were experiencing so much trauma and as a result our staff were experiencing so much trauma like just absorbing everything that the kids were bringing um, and then on top of that doing lots and lots of restraint which is just like horrible for everybody and so um so then then it kind of shifted um and i think the like leadership in the agency was pretty open to that like because I was just bringing a different different perspective on like, I think our kids are really dysregulated. And I think that's really dysregulating for the staff. And I think that's getting you into this cycle where everybody's just dysregulating everybody else until the end of the school day, and then you come back and start it again. And so, um, so people were, you know, like in ver to varying degrees, but open to the idea of like, let's rethink why kids have challenging behaviors um, and think about how to regulate their bodies because we're trying to do all these things reward them take things away give them points give them access to special things and like it just doesn't work um the, the literature tells us that doesn't work and our own eyes tell us like when we really look hard at that those kinds of systems um and so so it's been kind of a slow charge but that's um that was the original intent of the role. And then it's just kind of shaped with the needs of, of the agencies since then. Thanks, Julia. Um, you know, you, you've had a few more years to kind of shape that and understand that and kind of take that original vision and um, adjust that to where you feel you, you would be the most beneficial to the kids and families that you serve and the staff. And so Kate and Tom are a little bit earlier into that kind of um, journey. Uh, clearly your district had a vision for your positions. And so I'm just curious a little bit about what was your district's vision when they kind of brought you on and how, how, how have you been shaping that or how has that kind of morphed already in this first semester? So although we already had an established mental health team of rock star counselors and therapists, the district recognized that the mental health demands continued to grow. And they felt that bringing in some new positions would further just enhance the quality care that we can provide to our students, our families and our staff. Um, oftentimes the counselors might feel that there's like not enough hands on deck, so to speak. And so I've been able to take off some of the load and helping to meet with some students or take on cases that might require some more involvement, um, especially from the social work side of things and resource needs. It's truly been an incredible team with outstanding skill sets that we can all kind of bring to the table. And, and I'll let Tom speak to his own role, but I know he's also been able to bring us together by working on bigger scale initiatives as well. Um, so I think kind of all in all, we've been able to tackle mental health from so many different angles by bringing, kind of adding to the team. Yeah, and being our first year, you know, it, it's a it's a work in progress and kind of figuring out what what this what these roles really look like. And so a lot of it on my end has been trial and error, trying some different things. We don't know exactly what works. And if we did, our positions probably wouldn't exist. 
And so I think that's okay to keep in mind and that it's okay to try some different things. There's, there's nothing that's 100% working um, perfectly in any district. It's, it's what works for your community, what works for your district. Um, and so what really led the district to create this position in the first place was with, you know, even before COVID and the mental health concerns, uh, Pine Island formed a mental health and wellness committee. And then after the first committee, they were trying to work on some, some things. Our superintendent knew that, you know, it was a lot bigger than what the committee could serve immediately, immediately, immediately. And so they sent it to the board. It was quickly approved. Um, and then, yeah, the second edition was also based on unbelievable applicants. So it's really cool that Kate and I can work together, like she said, with our amazing mental health team. Uh, it, it's crazy to think that we could hire 10 more Kates uh, and always have that support for students. And I feel like our system will still be overwhelmed. Um, there's never enough support and enough people <laughs> that can help the kids right now. There are so many kids in crisis. There are so many staff who are struggling. Um, and so we can't just keep putting out fires, putting out fires. And so from, from my end, um, I really try to take a step back and think about sustainable approaches that will help in small ways. Small things that we can do to make school a fun place to be for students, for staff, um, and how, how can we do that? Uh, and so I always think about that. And so again, there's no perfect answers to that, but it's one small step that we can do. So in our first year, a lot of the things that we're trying and doing right now is just planting the seed. And we don't know what this tree is gonna look like in two years, five years, 10 years, um, but we're trying, so. That's great. Um, so that kind of leads to my next question. Um, is how will you know if there's success? Were there outcomes that were set for any of you about like, this is how we are gonna measure success, you know, from your school board or from your administrator about like, this is kind of the aim that we're trying to accomplish um, or as it was, or maybe there wasn't um, give that given to you. And do you have your kind of own measures of success about what you think is successful and what you think is not? How, how are you assessing that in your own practice? So I think um, we, I think it's been a really awesome opportunity because we've been given um, the ability to kind of decide what some of the needs might be kind of as we're going, kind of what Tom was saying. A lot of it's trial and error. We're kind of figuring out what's gonna work, what's not, gonna, what's not gonna work. Individually, I've had some professional goals that I've made kind of with the counseling team of, these were some, some blind spots and maybe I could focus in on those like, Truancy initiatives was one area that I've been focusing on and possibly incorporating some home visits to help those families that were really struggling to, to reach and to, to engage. Um, and then otherwise, another kind of individual goal that I had set for myself was getting some more groups available so that we can kind of cast a wider net, so to speak, reach more students. Um, since so many, as we were just talking about, so many are in crisis right now. And so kind of groups and bigger initiatives like that might be able to reach more. And then as far as kind of measuring that success, a lot of it is, I think, kind of self-reported or even just what sort of feedback I'm receiving from staff or from families or from students themselves. Like um, even just working with a student recently who was um, just, not engaging, not speaking, not um, answering any questions. And after developing a relationship and really meeting them where they're at, they're able to open up to me and even say like, gosh, I've never, I've never spoken to someone like this, or no one's just come out and asked me like, how am I doing? Or am I depressed? You know, those sorts of things. So for me, a lot of it is that self-reported, pro um, self-reported progress or success from the students and from like I said, staff too have come to me and said, it's been so helpful to have you here for this reason and this reason. And I think that goes a long way too. And at the end of the year, we'll be able to assess even more of kind of the initiatives that we put into place and see um, how kind of our, our staff mental health ratings are looking and kind of student mental health ratings are looking. And I think that's another big measure of success as well. Yeah, and just one thing to go off of what Kate said is, is in order to get that quality qualitative feedback, <laughs> it's common sense and it, it's just building those relationships first with those staff members and students and having them be able to trust you to actually tell them how you feel in a positive or negative way. Um, so I think, again, going back to building those relationships, the same way we do as teachers, 
to be able to have our, our, you know, the dynamics of our class be more of a community and for them to feel comfortable asking questions in our roles, I feel the same thing. And so sometimes um, it's easy in these different roles to get really busy and caught up in all these different initiatives and what can we do and this and that. And it's, it's okay to step back and just say, go pop into classrooms, be visible, let teachers know that, you know, you're coming into your classrooms, um, you know, just have small talk, be visible in the hallways, the little things like that can make a big difference in these kind of roles, I think. I think for me, there's been um, a few different measures, some like my own personally, and some um, like similarly to, to both of the other people, like um set by the school so one is like we do use restraint and seclusion and so um we want to see a, a reduction in like critical incidents at our schools um a lot of them happen because of this like code dysregulation pattern and so um we want to see those numbers just go down and they have been over the past several years and so we want to eliminate the need for that um i love to see the integration of better assessment i think right now a lot of what we go on is like how do we think a student is feeling do we think they're less depressed do we think they're less anxious, but we don't have good objective data on how our students are doing with their mental health and so integrating better assessment and that's tough. I think the reason for that is like go, going through the IEP process can be really hard when students parents are, you know, working multiple jobs have multiple kids at home are at high risk for COVID and can't come in, have lack, lack of access to technology, making online, like, there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, that's one thing, just integrating assessments and being able to track data in the same way that we can track like academic data, attendance data, those things we, we track really well. Um, I think we have a big issue with turnover. We lose staff a lot. Um, and I think most of the time when I have been supervising staff who are thinking about leaving, my position tends to be like, you have to do what's best for you. And this job is really stressful. It's stressful on your family. It's stressful. Like I've had people like, you know, my daughter's really freaked out that I come home with bruises multiple times a week. Like that's not good for your kid and you have to do what's best for your kid. And so um, thinking about like, if we can retain staff the way that other schools and systems do, um, that would definitely be a marker of success. And then um, Seneca's like guiding principle is unconditional care and unconditional education, which means theoretically we don't remove students from our schools or programs for the behaviors that brought them to our schools and programs. So, um, but that doesn't always happen in practice, right? We have students that will find like aren't making academic progress for two years in a row or are getting, you know, into physical management or having like big behavioral issues consistently daily for years um, and then we ultimately will make a decision to move a student to a different placement um, and so our team is like is the team that i'm on now which is myself an ot slash trauma person a school psychologist and a, a literacy specialist our job now is to really like take those students, find those students before we're having a conversation about whether or not they can be successful in our schools, do a really comprehensive assessment and like go into the team to help the team um, do what they need to do to support the student so that we don't have kids exiting our programs before they're ready. Um, and that's another marker, like it doesn't happen super often. There's maybe like one or two kids a year, I think, who, who are asked to leave the program before. Um, not because they're stepping down to a lower level of care, um, but we don't want to see that. Like we want to see kids be successful in our programs. And so um, that's one of my big measures for success. And then the last one is like, um, we have this weird relationship with evidence-based practice, I think in the mental health world that in some ways we see evidence-based practices as like great thing. Um, most of the literature isn't done on the students that I work with, right? They're not done on kids with complex ongoing early childhood trauma who are still living in a traumatic situation. They're not done on kids of color. They're not done on people living in poverty. And so um, I'd love to see a shift away from some of those things um, that were designed for like, mostly like middle class white communities or people with like one single event trauma like a car accident and move towards things with evidence for our actual kids and so that goes for any school right who's who are the kids in your school who are the families in your school and what's the literature that's about them and so i want to be integrating things like that and so we're moving towards things like collaborative problem solving by um Think Kids, Stuart Ablon, um, like the neurosequential model in education and therapeutics by Bruce Perry, um, uh, uh, restorative justice, 
like circles and things like that. So things that are actually about the kids that we serve, as opposed to like some of the SEL curriculums that were not designed for our kids or um, point and level systems or some of our schools that are still using points and levels. So I want to like, when we are done with stuff like that, I think that will be one measure of success um, for me. Thanks, Julia. So I have questions about all of that, but I would love to see questions from the participants. So if you have questions about what anybody has said, I don't want to um, just interject my voice in this. So if you have things that you would like to ask more about, please feel free to put them in the chat. I wanted to think about what about the philosophy? Is there a philosophy of change or a theory, um, a working kind of theory that you're coming from when you are addressing mental health? Um, I, I know that often in schools, we use kind of an MTSS framework about thinking about um, what do all students need, what do some students need, and what do uh, our most neediest students need, you know, like this kind of levels of support. And so um, that's one model, though, like, I think there's a lot of other models as well. And just thinking about, just curious if, if there's something that you that's been guiding your work or the framework that you're using that you'd be willing to share about. I can start. I think kind of using that trauma informed lens, I find I'm often trying to make room for the feelings where like it's okay to not be okay, that kind of a mindset. And I think sometimes we don't have a whole lot of tolerance for when kids or teens are in a bad mood. We kind of send the message that's not acceptable, something's wrong with you, we need you to get it out of the room or, you know, see the counselor, that kind of a thing. Um, and instead, I really aim to validate and make room for that and then kind of allowing a safe space to be vulnerable and have those feelings. I think another one that I really um, often utilize is behavior is communication and just seeing that every behavior has a function and, and kind of trying to read between the lines almost like what what is a student trying to get from this? What, what need is this behavior trying to meet? What are they trying to communicate to me? And, even if that communication is kind of clumsy, as I like to say, they're still trying to send a message. And so trying to, like I said, read between the lines. And then another concept that I also tap into often is from actually the work of good old Oprah and Dr. Bruce Perry and trauma work, instead of thinking what's wrong with you, what happened to you? And really trying to kind of see what is driving that behavior and empathize and, and kind of use that to help, to help meet the students where they're at. And for me, I want to continue. I'm really driven by, you know, my past experiences, especially when I was in middle school, high school, as somebody who, you know, applied to a few colleges and didn't get into them because of testing and my anxiety with different things. I'm okay to share this. I want to continue to make emotional intelligence in education just as important as those test scores and IQ. Um, and as somebody who has taught health and physical education, and prioritizes well-being in my own life. I just see so many kids and adults, especially, so out of touch with just simple health and wellness. Uh, we're out of touch with how to take care of yourself the right way. Um, so I've advocated for health and PE since I started working in education nine years ago. Um, and honestly, I think one of the uh, a simple way to provide well-being for our students is to have a quality health and PE program and take a peek at this. And so when you have administrators and who, who support that, um, that's one huge uh, proactive approach that you can take to help with that well-being of students. So, yeah. Um, I think I'm pretty similar to, to Kate and Tom. I think um, I'm pretty, I've been using um, Bruce Perry's neurosequential model for I don't know, like eight or nine years now. And, um, and so I, and as an OT, like I always think about the body first, like if, if our bodies are dysregulated, then we can't learn, we can't have good relationships. And so I, um, I'm really guided by the principle that like, we have to regulate and we have to have good relationships before we can reason and ask kids to learn. Um, and so I think we, I've sort of tried to change the conversation in our schools about self care, because we do the like, um, oh, we're going to have like a game day or we're going to do this on Fridays or this on Thursdays. And, and I think that's, that's really good. And I want our staff to have time with each other. Um, but I've sort of tried to shift it to like, 
what we know about the brain is that it is that emotions and arousal states are contagious. And so if we have a teacher in front of the classroom that is dysregulated because they had a bad night last night at home or because the behaviors in the classroom are so challenging or because they know that they don't have time for paperwork and they have two IEP meetings after school, like whatever the reason is, then the kids aren't going to learn as effectively. And so we've tried to shift the conversation to like self-care isn't like a cute thing to make time for if you can. It's actually a necessity of mental health work. Like a dysregulated person cannot regulate a dysregulated child. And so um, trying to shift it to like, what can we do throughout the day to keep people regulated, to make sure that our staff have good connection and relationships with each other so that they know that they can look out into the hall and say like, I need your help, can you come in here? No matter who it is in the hallway. Um, and that's something that happens in, in our schools frequently. And so we've, um, I definitely feel very guided by those same principles that Kate and Tom are talking about. Um, and then also from collaborative problem solving, the kids do well if they can. Like we have this um, thing that we sink into where if a child isn't doing well and we try one thing and they're still not doing well, it's like, well, they don't want it hard enough. They're not working hard enough. They're not motivated. I'm gonna offer them a treat if they do this thing five times. Um, and the reality is that kids do as well as they can with what they have. And so shifting the mindset to like, something's obviously lacking in this child's skill set or in the way that we're trying to teach or what we're teaching. Um, and so it's our responsibility to help the student get to where we want them to get. Um, and part of it is working with the family, part of it is working with the student, but um, just shifting the mindset away from thinking that like some kids want to do well and so they do and other kids don't. Um, and I think that's a lot easier said than done, but um, slowly you know, over the years we're seeing seeing a shift. And Julia, I think one thing that stuck out to me, and I, I love what you said, but I, I feel like 10 years ago, as, as teachers, the expectation is, you know, for example, you hit a deer and totally your car and then still drive to work, you, you know, you got to put on this new face and just say, okay, the kids can't know that I'm sick or the kids can't know that I had a bad morning. The kids can't know that I have my, my, my spouse is in the hospital right now. So I'm going to be a little off. I just have to fake it till it works out. And I think we don't expect our kids to leave their emotions at home when they come in. And I don't think that we should expect teachers and staff members to do that as well. So I think that's been a big shift and just like having that be okay um, can open up a, a big door in a conversation for teachers. Um, you know, if kids knew that I hit a deer and you know, hey, I'm a little flustered this morning, um, they'll have a little bit more empathy and know how to treat you with respect. And so that's just one little example that I thought about when Julia was talking. Yeah, it's like I, that brings to mind the idea of like decolonizing our practices, like moving away from this like blank slate. The adult is just this like person who can absorb anything, doesn't have a life behind the scenes towards like your therapist is a person and you have a real relationship like you matter to your therapist and your teacher and they think about you when you're not there um, and you think about them when they're not there and we're part of a community together. It's not just me delivering something to you because you're little and I'm big. Um, so I love that. It's like just a shift of like we're all people in a community together and we all can help each other regulate help each other feel good help each other like do the best that we can i love that idea yeah i've been talking a lot about this idea of community care you know that it's not enough that i think our a bit our ability to meet our own needs is insufficient right now. We, we need to be part of a community that comes together to care for each other. And that is not exclusive of adults and kids, right? Like that, that's not the way community works. Um, so we had a couple of questions in the chat that I just wanna um, circle back on. Actually, um, Julia, you talked a little bit about assessment. And I think that that's always, um, something that we're thinking about in schools that we um, sometimes feel that our mental health assessment that we do do is insufficient, right? For capturing the complexity of what students' needs are. And sometimes anything is better than maybe nothing, which is I think often what we have. So Julie, I think I'll turn it straight to, first to you to think about what kind of you're doing on a more um, kind of complex assessment. But I also heard Kate and Tom mention something around a scale to measure mental health that maybe Maybe you're using, using universal, Lee. So I, I'd be interested in hearing from both of you, but let's start with you, Julia. 
Yeah, um, so right now we use the cans, which I think is pretty widely used around the country. I don't find that to be especially helpful for like day to day treatment planning really at all. Um, it's a population tool, so it's not especially helpful for individual kids, I don't think. Um, but our schools are we're not using we're not regularly using any sort of standardized uh, mental health batteries. Um, I have tried, we are starting to do um, the neurosequential model metrics, which have been pretty helpful to teams. Um, and what that is, is um, you basically take a really comprehensive history about the student from conception through their current age, um, and you kind of put it in. And then the metric that you get back is a look at what areas of their brain have been impacted by their experience. So you can get a sense of like, how much adversity has a child experienced? How much relational health have they had? Like how much, how much support have they had and how much support have their support people had throughout their life? Um, and how much exposure to like community supports um, as well as like community issues have they had? And then um, you get a picture of sort of, not a, not a real picture, but like a, um, a schematic picture of um, what areas of the brain are, are kind of needing attention the most. Um, and that's been, I think, pretty helpful for people. Um, it's hard to implement that. You need someone trained in the model and training takes a long time. So um, I don't know that that's accessible, but I do know that there's NMT people all over the place. Um, we also, I like the sensory profile. Like we hear a lot of our staff are like, I think this kid has sensory stuff. I think you know, I think I might need something sensory. And so doing sensory checklists has been pretty helpful for us. Um, obviously, I'm biased as an OT. Um, and then even things like the trauma symptom checklist, the like parent stress index, things like those are, are pretty helpful. Um, and then like, even basic screeners like depression and anxiety screeners. I can't think of the names off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure Kate and Tom know them. Um, but things like that feel helpful. Like, is this child depressed? Because a lot of times we see like kids presenting as really angry or really dysregulated. We get a lot of ADHD diagnoses that I don't think are authentic ADHD. Um, and and so like I've tried, we're kind of encouraging people to think more deeply about what else could be going on and looking like a different thing. Um, so right now, unfortunately, we're not using a lot of assessments. Hopefully, if we do this again in a couple of years, I'll have a better answer. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it over. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes. we, oh, sorry. I think the screening tools have been really helpful in our district too, as just. Um, you know, we use the Reynolds Adolescent Depression Scale and we have another one for anxiety. Maybe somebody could pop in the chat what they use if you're looking at adopting those as a team. Um, I, I do think that, that that's maybe an easy entry point that I think you could do um, just as a department um, or as an individual provider. Sorry, Kate, I interrupted you. Um, That's okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I was going to just piggybacking off of what Julia said. Our district doesn't have like standardized mental health assessments that every student does per se. Um, we do kind of like our own sort of survey to get a gauge on um, how students are feeling about their mental health. And so we might ask some general kind of stress management sorts of questions, then use that data to kind of guide like groups that I'm running, for instance, at the high school level. Um, when I am meeting with students individually, since I have, I am a licensed therapist, even though I'm not a therapist in this role, I typically will bring up the PHQ-9 and just kind of informally running through those questions, the PHQ-9M or the GAD-7 or the SPENCE would be some standardized tools that I might incorporate into my own practice. But um, district-wide anyway, the students aren't at this time doing something standardized. So I too, like Julia was saying, that might be something that we could, we could look into. You know, in um, the district in which I work, we also use a tool called Panorama, which also is not perfect, but it is a population-based um, measure that we can get an idea of what is, it really measures student perceptions of SEL skills. So it's not necessarily mental health and I'm clear to make that distinction, but it, it is something that um, we have used in our district to help measure where, whether or not our students feel like their own skill, if they have their, their own skills in order in that area of social emotional relationships really. So um, we had another question that I'll go to first. Um, so Christina is asking about um, 
kind of this theory of change where, you know, if the adults are able to make some um, changes and there's some mindset or shifts on their ends that a lot of times that's necessary before we see changes in their interactions with students. And so um, just, I think, looking for some, from your experience, what's been helpful in providing staff development to staff um, and providing a space for them to reflect on their my own mindset. Have you had any successful experiences? Maybe touching again on reflective supervision, um, Julia, if you would maybe start. I know you mentioned that briefly, um, but I know that's a unique practice that you have been able to establish. Yeah, um, this is a great question. And I think when I started, I was like, I'm just gonna teach everyone what I think I want them to know that I know, and then like, we'll be good to go. And that's obviously not how the world works or how humans work. Um, and so like, I used to do a lot of training, like me talking, people listening, and there was like activities and 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 things like that. But um, it just wasn't working. It wasn't fun. And it was kind of burning me out to be like talking to groups who didn't want to listen so often. Um, and so I have tried to switch to, um, I kind of, I was part of a, I did a fellowship and had to do a capstone project. And for my capstone, I did, I created a model of reflective practice on the go. So um, basically like I tried to shift my mindset to like any time a staff is talking to me, no matter what it's about, I wanna like take a breath, regulate myself and treat it as an opportunity for training or just connecting. And so um, it could be that someone's like, Julia, should I play checkers or, you know, twister with a kid? And I'm like, well, that's a great question. Let's think about it. What are you trying to achieve? Um, oh, the kid's really dysregulated and, and they're a mover. Like, it sounds like twister might be a better choice because they'd get to move their body. Um, and so like that, it's like a one minute interaction, but I tried to switch from like me telling people what I thought to like, how can I engage you in thinking about how to make your practice better? Um, one, because I'm not always going to be there, but also because I think our like fast pace just makes people think like every decision needs to be is urgent and everything is needs to happen right now or yesterday and i don't think that's true like kids heal over a long period of time like what you do today really matters but it doesn't matter as much as you like developing skills that you're going to constantly be improving on over time and so um trying to connect with staff on their timeline instead of on our like training calendar timeline has been has been a big thing um and also people have started and i'm like really something happened during COVID where like our staff are just like we don't want any more meetings we cannot do this we can't absorb the amount of information like every month there's a new model someone's trying to roll out we're always trying to we're always being told we have to learn a new thing and it's just like it's it's too much and i feel excited about it but i'm not a teacher like i'm not in the classroom with 12 or 20 kids staring at me all day so to me it feels exciting sometimes but it's but that's not the reality and so i'm switching to like one-on-one -on -one conversations with staff and then i've realized like when i do that often what happens is someone else will come and be like hey you know nick told me this thing that you told him but he did, couldn't remember what you said can you tell me now so like that's two people and that might be the only two people that i would have reached in a big training anyway. So to me, like the impact is almost the same. Um, and we still do those big trainings, but um, but I think the like closer connection and taking things down to like, I can actually accomplish quite a bit in a five minute conversation when the staff wants that conversation um, more than I, than I thought. And so I'm trying to shift myself to be like always, always thinking that way. So. I don't have a perfect answer for this because, you know, being in your first year, that first year, second year, third year, it's, it's, it's about building trust in those relationships first. Uh, at the same time, there is professional development that um, happens on a daily basis, like Julia said. And I think one of the most successful things that I naturally found this year, other than the hundreds of ideas that I thought about all summer that never happened, <laughs> included just simply getting to know that teacher, what they're doing, and then, you know, working with the QCOMP coach as well. So there's a little incentive piece based off of something that they want to build on as a teacher. And then me being able to kind of put some input into it that as well, instead of just thinking, um, hey, I sent out this survey, here's, here's what teachers need, and then just trying to make it more of a macro style, um, one size fits all thing. So um, Julia, your experiences uh, align kind of what I'm thinking as well. So I appreciate you sharing that. 
I'd like to also share that our district has been incorporating some staff development. Um, I'm blanking on her last name, maybe Tom can pipe in, but Bethany, and she works with an agency called Flourish Consulting. I saw you unmuted. Do you remember her name? <laughs> That's okay. I was just going to say Bethany, but yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, and she's doing kind of a Brene Brown um, Dare to Lead Leadership Series. And so we've actually got um, I think our third one coming up. We have third of the fourth coming up next week here. Um, and that's been awesome. So for all staff to, like the last session was very focused on our values. So for all staff to do a lot of reflection on kind of what really motivates me, what really drives me, what gets me out of, the, out of bed in the morning and kind of how to be more um, cognizant of that, how to bring that forward and then how that might apply to teaching lessons with our students. So I think that's been a really excellent um, Kind of adult SEL as the question said. I haven't really thought of it that way, but it very much is adult SEL. And then another piece that um, Tom had had uh, alluded to earlier was the Calm Classroom series. And so, in order to incorporate some mindfulness lessons into the classrooms, we first have to be trained, um, teachers included. And so, they go through their own mindfulness um, techniques and learning how to apply those. And very much when we're teaching mindfulness to others, for others who apply that into their own daily practice, we know we need to live it ourselves. And so I think that's been really, really powerful and has has received a lot of positive feedback from district uh, from the district. Muted. Um, we have just under 10 minutes left, and so I think we'll just finish up with the a question about like what advice you might have if you um you know in our audience I'm sure we have a lot of people who are thinking about like what more can we do at our district and in, or in my school building so um if you have pieces of advice about like what to do first or maybe an approach to take or how to um advocate for more mental health support or creating a team around student mental health if you have any pieces of advice or things that you've seen work, um, we'll just finish off with that question before we close up today. I could start. Um, I think my best advice would be to let them tell you what they need. So when it comes to students, when it comes to staff or families, really giving them an avenue or a platform where they can express those concerns or express those requests. Um, I've alluded to surveys quite a few times in our meeting today, and I really think that's an excellent way to get that input and get those opinions, especially from those shyer students who might be secretly really struggling with debilitating depression or anxiety. It's hard to approach this, especially in my position, I'm a new, a new person, so it's hard to approach me face to face and say, hey, I need help. It's much easier in a survey or even in an email of some sorts to communicate that, that they need need this sort of help. Um, and then also just meeting the kids where they're at. So what sorts of struggles would they set as a priority? Um, even though I might look at a classroom or look at the data, for instance, and think, oh, it really looks like this might be an issue. It's really important to hear firsthand what the students or staff feel is an area that we need to focus on. And so I think there's so much that I learned from the students about even just the goings-ons of the school, um, but they really know the real pulse of what's going on and the real climate. And then make connections. That's another big part of um, being a social worker, being um, someone who works directly with students is making those connections. And that's how we really can get in um, and through that kind of, I call it a crusty marshmallow, kind of get through that crusty exterior into that mushy gooey, gooey center where that real person is. And then I would say, keep trying some of the things that you're doing and don't be afraid to try something new uh, and have empathy for yourself as much as you do for your students. Um, if we had this all figured out, this Zoom meeting wouldn't exist, our positions wouldn't exist, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see school counselors, school social workers, um, people wouldn't need us. And one of the hardest things that I'm seeing, and I felt it too as a teacher, is it hasn't been about the changes in what kids are learning or how we're delivering it. And to me, it's been, it's been the grind knowing that these kids we love so much are struggling and there's nothing magical that we can do to fix it in one day. Uh, and so that's what I'm hearing a lot from, from teachers and I'm seeing it and I'm feeling it myself too. Uh, and then my second one is just continue to find ways to prioritize those relationships 
give yourself grace. I truly think there needs to be a societal shift and it needs to start with our leaders um, with just trying to figure out ways to keep the workday the workday um, and not get emails throughout the day and not get, you know, so for me personally, I always talk about this, but yet here I am when I'm hanging out with my my little one run into the bathroom and checking my email. I'm like, no, I'm done with that. And so I think there needs to be a shift just in general because when distance learning jumped up, um, I feel like teachers felt obligated and we always feel obligated to respond right away. And so something needs to change from a society standpoint with that. Uh, and, you know, I read recently too that 40% of our administrators say that they would quit their jobs if they could, which is super sad. And we need to think about them as well and how we can take care of the leaders of our schools um, the best we can, so. Um, I think my advice, especially to the people that are, um, are like, I wanna bring mental health, but it's not being taken seriously or, or something like that is like, find one person who's on your team. Um, I saw a TED talk and I can't remember the name of the person who did it, but um, that it's it's hard to be a leader, but it's also hard to be the first follower in a new movement. And so like, I think sometimes we, it's just, it's scary for people to take that leap and say like, yeah, I'm actually gonna go down this new path, even though no one else is. Um, and so like find your one person who can be a change maker because that person will probably bring other people with them. Um, and then I think like, model implementation and system change takes a long time and we I, at least for me like we tend to think in one school year cycles but that's not enough time like it's more like five to seven years is when you see like real lasting durable change in a system and so um just like um kate and tom said like being patient having empathy for yourself that like you put in a day's work and you might not see the outcome of that for another five years but it doesn't mean it didn't matter um and just like find a group that feeds you and like i have a couple people that i know like i can go to and say like oh if we could just do this it would be better like i just need and like that's really important so that when i'm with the people who aren't sure or don't want to change or are comfortable with how it is i have a little bit of like gas in the tank to be supportive and reflective and empathic for where they're at too um and so i think like find your people is a is a big piece of it and like make make just like little tiny changes like one at a time so that it's manageable thank you for that advice thank you for all the work that you are doing in your buildings and in your circle of influence thank you to all that were here today um just excited to have you um here and hope that you found this helpful we do have a couple of opportunities that are coming up that I just wanted to share with you. The first is we are hosting a supporting school mental health conference that is going to be both virtual and in person, which is a first for us here at Resilience Impact. But Julia is gonna be joining us on May 5th and 6th up at Craigens in Brainerd, Minnesota. May is usually a pretty nice time in Minnesota. So, um, and uh, for those of you that haven't been there, Craigens is kind of a, I, it reminds me of the Dirty Dancing Hotel. It's kind of like an old school Minnesota resort. So um, that will be a good time, but there's also the opportunity to join that virtual if um, coming in person isn't something that you feel comfortable with or is not an option for you. And then we are also um, doing a training again in February. We do these every month. And so we are doing, um, I will be teaching around supporting educator resilience. So really um, talking more about that topic about how do we shift from this idea that um, teachers just kind of have to take care of themselves um, and really encouraging a community approach to um, supporting each other. So hope that that would be of interest to you. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Thank you, Kate, Tom, and Julia for being here. I really appreciated the conversation and um, I'm just thankful for you and all of the work that you're doing.